Hi everyone, and welcome back to another recorded lecture of genetics. Today we'll be discussing chapter 22, which is the last chapter. And chapter 22 discusses heritability, which is talking about how different phenotypes are influenced by the genes that encode those phenotypes, but also by the environment. So we'll talk um, only about section one in this talk, and we're going to summarize what it means um, to be phenotypically variant. So what is phenotypic variance? Then we'll talk about experiments that will allow us to distinguish between genetic and environmental influences on the phenotypic variance. We'll then talk about the term heritability and how it applies to populations. And finally, we'll discuss how scientists can estimate heritability of certain traits in animal populations um, or in human populations. So we're going to talk about complex traits. We started talking about complex traits um, in chapter 21. Uh, complex traits include personality, intelligence, height, and skin color. All of these complex traits are influenced by many factors, right? There are multiple genes that contribute to each of these traits. These alleles can then interact with each other. There's differences in the environment that also contribute to variation. And there's random chance. And with all of that, right, the interactions between the alleles and the environment can also Ah, so we have complex traits influenced not only by multiple genes, how those genes interact, but also the differences in the environment. Sometimes there's just some random chance differences because of meiosis or because of another um, improbable event happening. And the alleles can also interact with their environment. So complex traits are the opposite of discrete traits, where it's like a yes or no. And we spoke a lot of, in the beginning, like chapter two, about monogenic traits, whereas one gene causes one phenotype. But this is very different um, from the reality. So a lot of traits are complex because they are influenced by many factors. So this is an interesting graph, uh, figure 22.1, that's shown in the book. And it shows that many different populations in Europe um, had it showed an increase in height in the 20th century. And uh, you could see from 1850 to the year 2000, there was a huge shift just in 150 years. So this is an interesting question. Is it possible that alleles changed in the population so that um, height genes were more prevalent in the later part of, um, of the 1900s? So is it possible that genes alone could have contributed to the increase in adult human height? And the answer is no, it's not enough. We can't expect mutations to occur and to be passed on in just 150 years to see such a huge difference in height. So it's way too short of a time span to be due to a change in allele frequencies. Thus, it's probably due to the environment Right. So specifically when I say environment and probably means improvements in diet. So Europeans had improvements in diet over the past 150 years. And that is what contributed to the height increase, not just genes. So complex traits like height are influenced by genes, but also environment. Many complex traits are quantitative. Quantitative means that they can be measured over a range of numbers. So quantitative means numerical. So things like height or IQ are quantitative. They're measured over a range of numbers called trait values. Trait values are also called phenotypic values. And most of these traits show a roughly bell-shaped curve of normal distribution of phenotypic values. So many traits show this normal distribution of trait values, which is known as a bell curve, right, a bell curve. And let's use the example of height again. So let's say, so here's the different trait values. Well, let's say four is the, the tallest, um, zero is the shortest. 
Very few people are either very tall or very short. Most are clustered around the mean. So just by genes themselves, right? Most people will be somewhere around the mean with fewer people at either of the extremes. So that's the genetic influence, but the environment also shapes the continuous distribution of traits. So what you see here is almost this blurring, right? So each of these trait values becomes blurred by environmental influences. So let me explain. Within the average, right, the middle height people, within the average, because they're exposed to differences in environment, even within them, there's almost a bell-shaped curve of distribution, where most will not be strongly impacted by the environment, but some who are still at a trait value of two still might be impacted by the environment and might be on either extreme. So this blurring, right, of genes and environment um, give us this image over here, this nice bell curve shape, right? So this is what it's, this is um, the continuous distribution of height, right? And that's shaped by the contributions of both genes and the environment. And in general, whenever you see this uh, bell curve, this normal distribution shows data that vary randomly from the mean. So the normal curve is bell shaped. And as a rule, 68% of the data fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So the mean is always the line in the middle, right, at the peak. And the distance between here and one standard deviation is 34%. Between two standard deviations, right, the distance between here and here and here and here all equal to 95%. So 95% of all of the data will be stuck in between here and here. All right, so 95% of the data fall within two standard deviations of the mean. 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation of the mean. So that's what a bell curve is. So now let's talk about how do scientists evaluate the heritability of a trait, right? What, is the, what are the different contributions of genes versus the environment? So what heritability is asking, what heritability is saying, it's how much do genes contribute to variations in phenotype among a population as opposed to environmental effects, right? So if I see these differences in a population, are those differences due to genes? or are those differences due to the environment or some combination of both? Right, so that's what we're talking about here. That's the heritability. And when we say environmental effects, that also includes random chance. So what we're saying is how heritable is a trait? How much of the variation is due to just the genes alone and not the environment or random chance or allele interactions? How much are just how much of that variability is just due to genes. So we'll use an example of dandelions that can help sort out the effects of genes versus the environment. And we'll use the trait of stem length. So we're going to measure how tall all these dandelions are. That's our um, trait we're looking at is the height of dandelion stems. And our goal is to compare the influence of genes versus the environment on how tall these dandelions can grow. So what we first have to do to estimate heritability is we have to obtain a numerical description for this bell-shaped curve uh, to figure out what the trait distribution is in the population we're studying. So what we have to do is first find the mean stem length. So let's say we're going to uh, Boston Commons, and we're looking at all the dandelions. Um, there's a lot of different heights of the dandelions. We're going to count all of them and find the average stem length. We're then going to have to calculate what's termed the total 
phenotype variance or the VP, the VP. So we the scientists are going to track the amount of variation by comparing the average phenotype value, so the average dandelion height, to the population as a whole. That's what this VP means. It's the average squared difference between each individual trait value and the mean. So again, the first step to figure this out is to find the average stem length of all of the different dandelions in the population. Then you have to take each individual dandelion height and you subtract that from the mean. So you're seeing how different is each individual dandelion's height from the average height. So this variance provides a mathematical description of the distribution of height. And the narrower the curve, the less the variance, right? The lower the variance. And that should make sense because the higher, the, the wider the curve, that means there's more variance. So let's look at the equations. To find the mean, I think you all know how to do that already. Um, but to find the variance, what you're doing is you're taking each individual value of height, you're subtracting that, um, you're subtracting the average from that, and you're squaring it. So let's say you count 100 dandelions and the average height is 5 inches. And you have, again, I have 100 of them, so some are going to be 3 inches, some are going to be 6 inches. So you're going to have to subtract. You would take 3 minus 5 squared divided by the number of dandelions you count. So for each each of those 100 dandelions you count, you have to subtract that, um, or sorry, subtract the mean from each of those values, square it, and then divide by the total number of dandelions you counted. And that's going to give you a value of phenotypic variance, which is going to tell you how much does the average dandelion uh, differ from the mean, from the average. How variant are all the different stem lengths? Right, and the narrower the curve, the more similar all the dandelions would be. So when you plot this, you're plotting stem length. So again, for each of the stem lengths, let's say this is five centimeters or five inches over here. When you plot each of them, you, you're going to probably get a shape that looks like this. If you just were to count 100 and you plotted... Um, like a histogram, you plotted each, the number of plants that were at each height. You would get something that looked like a bell curve. And if you were to take the distance between the mean and the outside of the curve, that is equivalent to the square root of VP. That's equivalent to the square root of VP. So this is um, a very important value. And remember that the narrower the curve relative to the peak, the lower the value of the variance. So once the total variance of the trait is determined, we can then begin to ask what fraction of this variance is due to differences in the genes carried by the individual organisms, and what part is due to differences in the microenvironments to which these individuals are subjected. So we have the total phenotypic variance. How much do the, the phenotypes vary, period? We don't know what's causing that variation yet. So now the first step is to figure out what is the role, right now that we found the total variance in phenotype, we wanna figure out how much of that variance is due to the environment. How much of the, the differences in dandelion stem height um, or due to the environment and not the genes. So for this, we have to do an experiment. We have to grow genetically identical seeds, clones of each other, in a variable environment. And we're going to then measure what's called VE, the environmental variance. So we're going to take clones of each other, the same genes, all these seeds, same exact genes, and we grow them in very different environments. And then we're gonna see how tall they grow. So I want you to pause the video now and think about why this experiment makes sense. To control 
or sorry, to figure out the environmental variance, why do we want to grow identical seeds in a variable environment? So pause here and tell me um, what you think the answer is. All right, so what you can do is you can plant identical seeds along different parts of a hillside. Let's say you have a, a hill, you can, and there might be some areas that are more moist, some that are um, higher elevations, some that are closer to the sun. So on a hillside, you have a lot of different microenvironments. So you're going to take identical seeds, plant them in a different environment, and measure the stem length. Since all seeds from a single plant are genetically identical, any changes you observe are strictly due to the environment, right? Any changes you observe in this experiment are not due to genes at all, right? Because they're genetically identical. So what you're going to do now is once you grow these identical seeds in different microenvironments, you're going to do the same type of experiment. You're going to count your hundred seeds, your hundred plants, and plot the number of plants at each stem length. And then you can figure out the average or sorry, the square root of the environmental variance. So that's the change, the variation due to the environment. So now we have to do the inverse experiment to calculate the genetic variance, right? To examine the impact of genetic differences on stem length, we have to take seeds from many different dandelion plants produced in many different locations and keep the environment constant. So you take dandelions from all around, you take different, um, that different species that are or not different species, but different varieties that are different heights. You take those seeds and you put them in a stable greenhouse, same exact environment. This time you're going to look at the stem length and anything you see, right? Any of the um, variation you see in stem length must be due to genetic differences because you're raising them in a relatively uniform environment. Right. So in this way, after you grow these different seeds in the same environment, you're going to see what the effect of the genes themselves are on stem length. So you're going to do the same type of thing to figure out the genetic variance. Right. So these are genetically different seeds grown in a constant environment. So, so far we figured out VE and VG we discussed experiments for. Finally, we have to determine the phenotypic variance in this example, right? We gave you, I told you how you would do it um, in Boston Common, for example, like how you would count all the different um, dandelion heights that come from different genes and different environments. That would give you a rough idea of the total phenotypic variance. Um, so for this example, after you um, find the VE by growing genetically, um, identical seeds in uh, different environments and then finding VG by control by taking different genetically um, distinct seeds and planting them in the same environment. Now what we're going to do is grow genetically diverse seeds in diverse environments. So we take seeds of many different plants from many different locations and grow them on a hillside with a variety of microenvironments. And for the population of dandelions that grow up from these genetically diverse seeds, the VP and stem length will be equivalent to the VG, the genetic variance, and the VE, the environmental variance. So this graph over here, uh, 22.5C, shows you how VP is equivalent to VE plus VG. So note that that curve is broader than either that for the genetically identical individuals on a hillside or for the gen genetically variable individuals grown in a controlled greenhouse. That means for natural populations of dandelions, both genetic variation among individuals and variation in the environmental conditions experienced by the plant 
contribute to the total phenotypic variation. So for the exam, you won't be asked to calculate the variance, but you might be asked to look at a graph um, like this. So which of the following contributes to the length of dandelion stems? The answer is C, genes and environment. Which contributes most to the length of dandelion stems? So pause here. And you can see that genes play a lot bigger role in determining the uh, length of dandelion stems. Because when you grow I genetically identical seeds in a variable environment, you see very little variance compared to when you grow different genetically um, diverse seeds, you get a lot of variance. That means genes have a lot to do with it. So now we can introduce this term heritability um, in a more mathematical uh, fashion. So heritability of a trait is the proportion of the total phenotypic variance that's due to genetic variation, right? So we said heritability, it's how much of the variation in a population is due to genes alone. So we could say that heritability equals VG over VP. And if you recall, VP equals VG plus VE. So what this is basically telling us, this equation for heritability, is for a given trait, what proportion of the variation observed within a population is not explained by the environment or random chance? Again, I'll say this again. It's a little confusing, and a lot of students struggle with this at first. But what heritability is telling us, for a given trait, what proportion of the variation I see within a population is not explained by the environment or random chance and are explained by just genes alone. So if I see a population of individuals with so many different heights, if I want to figure out the heritability of height, I'm asking, what causes all these differences in height? Is it genes or is it more due to the environment and random chance? That's what heritability is discussing. If our heritability is zero, that means all of the observed phenotype variation is due to environment or random chance alone, not due to genetics. Heritability of zero means it's zero percent genetic. All of the variation you see is due to the environment or just random chance alone. At the other extreme, a heritability of one means all of the observed phenotype variation is just due to genetic variation, regardless of the type of the environment they're in. We never really see these extremes. You'll never see a heritability of one because environment has everything to do with the way that genes get expressed. Right, and most things do have some genetic component. So we never really see a heritability of zero or one. And keep in mind that heritability is only defined for a specific population and environment. So you can't say the heritability of height is something for every population across all periods. We just sh uh, showed the example of in Europe how in 150 years, there is a huge difference um, in the heritability of height because of environmental influences, like the availability of food. Or think of, so if you said that the heritability of alcoholism is 0.4, it does not mean that 40% of a person's susceptibility to alcoholism is due to genes and 60% of the environment. That's a common misconception, right? What this means is that for a population, 40% of the phenotypic variation in alcoholism can be attributed to genetic differences between ind individuals in that population. So you could say 40%, right, of the variation 
So 40%, and we'll talk about what this really means with more examples, but it talks about within a specific time and it's talking about a specific population, not one person and not just one trait overall. You can't say that alcoholism is 40% genetic. You can say that among a population, 60% of the variation and whether somebody was alcoholic or not was not due to genes alone. There was no genetic component to 60% of that variation. So we said heritability is not measured for individuals, right? And we said if heritability for alcoholism is 0.4, does not mean that a person's genes contributes 40% to alcoholism, right? It means 40% of that variation in the population is due to genetic differences between individuals. So this gets a little tricky when we talk about genetic variants. So genetic variants can be subdivided into three components. The first of these is called VA, or the variance due to additive genetic effects. So VA is the additive effect, and this is basically telling us this is the main part of genetic contribution. What do the alleles contribute to the trait? We know that each gene could have a different trait value, can give us a different trait. So what do we get from each of the genes that we're inheriting from mom and dad? This is the main source of genetic variation. So again, this is saying, if you have these alleles, what trait do you show? There's two other aspects of genetic variation that are harder to define. The first is VD, variation due to dominance effects. So dominance adds um, another layer of complexity to variance because a heterozygote for a dominant allele has the same phenotype as a homozygote for the allele. So like big A, big A, and big A, little a are both the same phenotype, but they have a different genotype. So those genes themselves, those alleles might have a different effect on genetic variants. Um, so variation due to dominance is another way that genes, uh, genetic variants can be subdivided, right? So alleles can interact at a single locus, even though they have the same phenotype. And then finally, you can also have uh, variants due to interactions because you can have epistasis, for example, right? Just because you have an allele for one gene doesn't mean that you're gonna express that allele because you might have an allele for a different gene that masks the expression of it. So again, but this is saying, this is confusing. I will definitely admit it. Genetic variation includes all the differences between which alleles you have, which alleles are dominant to one another, and how those alleles interact. Those are the several ways that all the, that genes can affect a phenotype. We're gonna most, so VG, right? All the genetic variation is equal to the additive effects of genes, the dominance effect of genes, and then the interactive effects of genes. So the total genetic variance is the sum, sum of its three components. VG equals VA plus VD plus VI. So now we can talk about heritability in two senses. We can say that there is broad sense heritability, which is capital H squared, or narrow sense heritability, which is little h squared. Broad sense heritability is the most um, reliable, it's the most precise and exact way to measure um, genetic variants uh, over phenotypic variants because broad sense heritability measures the proportion of phenotypic variants due to the genetic effects that also include dominance and interactions. So I want to show you this. I'm going to cut ahead, but broad sense heritability, remember we said heritability equals VG over VP. And broad sense heritability takes into account all three subparts of genetic variants. So the additive effects, 
the dominance effects, and the interactive effects. This is where it gets a little tricky. So unfortunately, two siblings would not have the same alleles, right? Two, if you want to compare twins uh, to each other, or not, sorry, if you want to compare two siblings with each other, they're going to have different combinations of alleles. So you can't really compare um, dominance effects or interactive effects because you don't know which other alleles they have. So the only way you can measure broad sense heritability is when you're comparing identical twins to each other. So since identical twins have the same exact alleles at all the same loci, they're going to have the same additive effects, the same dominance effects, and the same interactive effects because they're clones of each other, right? So they're going to have all three components. So broad sense heritability is typically measured only in studies that compare identical twins to each other because they have the same alleles at all loci. So all three components of genetic variants are the same in both twins. However, if I'm comparing, I'm sorry, just keep in mind that this is the equation VA plus VD plus VI equals VG. And VG plus VE equals VP. Right, the total phenotypic variance is equal to VG plus VE. So what I was saying before, is we cannot compare phenotypic values between parents and offspring using um, broad sense heritability because only one of the alleles at any locus is shared between any one offspring and any one parent. Right? So you can't just compare parents and offspring because they share only 50% of the alleles. So if mom is big A, little A, she's either going to give a big A or a little A to the child. So the child will never have the same exact genotype as the parent, will only have 50% the genetic relatedness to the parent. So the allele of each locus that is shared between a parent and an offspring must be considered as a genetic factor that acts in a simple additive fashion. Therefore, when we compare parents and offspring, we only take into account the VA, the additive component of overall genetic variance, because VI and VD are randomized over the population. We can't really measure um, an individual's dominant effects because we don't know their entire se gene sequence, right? We can only see uh, the additive effects. So the heritability, valued, uh, the heritability value that we estimate in studies of parents and offspring is called narrow sense heritability. Narrow sense heritability. And again, this is because only one allele at any given locus is shared between parents and offspring. We can't measure VD and VI. We don't know what the other alleles are. We don't know how they're interacting. So the comparisons of parents and offspring represent additive variants, VA only. And this is basically saying, how much does the presence of parental alleles contribute to the offspring's phenotype? If the mom is big A, big A, how much does giving a big A to the child affect that phenotype? Right? If it's 100% heritability, that means that any time the mom gives big A, the child will have that big A expressed. But we know that's not usually the case. So for narrow sense heritability, little h squared, we're just taking into account VA, the additive effects, over VP. So take a second to answer this question. The answer is C. If the mean trade value of the progeny is always similar to the population, regardless of parental phenotype, what is the heritability? So pause here. And the answer is zero. Right, so if every time um, somebody's born, they have the same as the popula population mean, the same value, 
That means that it's all about the environment, right? Or nothing to do with genes. Regardless of the parents, it's the same as the mean, means that there's a zero heritability. All right, so if the mean trait value of the progeny is always similar to the population, regardless of parental genotype, the heritability is zero. And that's, this looks confusing, this graph, but it actually um, makes a lot of sense. This is the parent generation up here. And let's think about height. This is height. And then over here, this is this purple line represents the progeny generation. So if we take two tall parents on average, right, let's say we take two tall parents and they have children that are exactly at the mean of the parent population, right? So let's say the mean is 50 inches. Again, this doesn't make sense, but I'm just going to the mean is 50 inches, but they took parents that were 90 inches tall, but they still had children that were 50 inches. That means the heritability H squared is zero, right? There is no contribution of these genes to the trait. If it looked exactly like the mean did anyway, right? Let's say if the parents were slightly tall, they were 25% um, taller than the average. So if they were 25% taller than the average, that would be about 62.5 inches. So since they did increase they deviated from the population average by 25% as much as their parents do. So if the children came out to be 62.5, they're still a little taller than the, the mean, but they're still not nearly as tall as the parents. So we therefore say the heritability is 0.25 because the progeny deviated from the population average by 25% <clears throat> as much as their parents do. So the heritability is 0.25. 25% right, of the genetic variance in height was due to genes alone, the additive effects of genes. Suppose that your 90 inch parents give you 90 inch offspring. So if the progeny deviate from the population exactly as their parents do, the heritability is one, right? That means the alleles inherited from the parents fully determine the phenotype. So you could look over this at home. I just typed out what I just explained. So now let's apply these um, equations to real examples. So the first example I want to talk about is measuring the heritability of bill depth, right? This is the little bill of these finches um, and Darwin's finches. So we want to see how does the size of this bill, um, how is it affected by genes versus the environment? So they studied this um, finch on one of the Galapagos Islands. And what they did was they measured the build depth of the mother, the father, and the offspring of each nest. So they looked at different finch nests. They measured the bill of the mom, the bill of the dad, and the bill of the baby. And they wanted to see, was the baby's bill depth correlated to either of the parents. So was there a re relationship between the size of the parent's bill and the bill of their offspring? So this was how they measure the heritability. What they did was they first calculated the mid-parent value, the mid-parent value. So suppose you have a mom and a dad in a nest. One has a bill depth of eight centimeters, one has the, and the mom has a buildup of six. So one has eight, one has six. The mid parent build depth is seven, right? It's the average. So if you take eight plus six, 14 divided by two, the mid parent build depth is seven centimeters. So that's the mid parent value. The idea for height, if you have one parent that's 50 inches, one that's 60 inches, then 55 inches is the mid parent value. So what they did was they plotted the build depth of the offspring against the mid, the average build depth of the parent or the mid parent build depth. 
So for example, when they looked at one buildup that was eight millimeters, or let's look at this, when the average build depth of the parents was eight millimeters, the offspring had a bill of eight millimeters. Over here, when it was about 8.4 millimeters, again, the offspring was about 8.4. Here's an example where it didn't correlate. So this, the mid-parent build depth was about 8.4, but the children were under eight. They were still less than eight. So each dot on this line, each of these red dots represents the correlation. It's a scatter plot, right? That shows how the mid parents build up affected the offsprings build up. So when we plot the build up of offspring against their parents, mid parents, sorry, their, um, their parents average build up on a scatter plot, we can take the slope of the correlation line. So you take all these red dots and you could use math to find the correlation, the correlation coefficient or R. So if you take the slope, like rise over run, right? Y over X, you can figure out the slope of this line. And R, the correlation coefficient is an estimate of H squared. It's an estimate of narrow sense heritability. And again, this should, makes sense, right? So if you have a nine millimeter mid parent build depth and then the offspring was nine, and then 10 millimeter build depth and the offspring was 10. If you have that kind of relationship, that core, that slope would be one, which would mean that no matter what the parents are, that's what the children are. That means that it's very heritable, right? So a high heritability means you have a high slope, a high correlation. That means whatever the mid-parent build depth is, that directly impacts what the offspring are. So the higher the slope, the steeper the slope, right, the more heritable that trait is. The more correlated the mid-parent build depth is with the offspring build depth. So since there is a very high correlation um, between beak size of offspring and the average of the parent's beak size, we said the slope was about 0.82. That means that heritability is 0.82, means that 82% of the variation in build depth is due to additive genetic variation. 18% of the variation in build depth is due to environmental and non-additive genetic effects in this population of Darwin's finches. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So when you want to find narrow sense heritability, you can plot the mid-parent value times the offspring values, find the slope R, and that's a measure of H squared, narrow sense heritability, right? And it's narrow sense because we're plotting the offspring against the mid-parent value. So they only share half the genes, right? Offspring only have half the genes of either parent. So we can't measure broad sense heritability. Interestingly, this exact study was conducted twice before and after a large drought. So the red line represents 1976 um, and the blue line represents 1978. So why, why do you think there was a difference? So what's the difference in here, right? The mean beak depth was higher in 1978 but they still got a slope of about 0.82. So what does that mean? So think, take a second to think about what that can mean. So perhaps after this drought, um, some of the softer seeds were no longer available on the island. So all the finches um, with small beaks could not eat. Only the finches with large enough um, bills could crack the harder, larger seeds that were available after the drought. So there was natural selection. So only those finches with a large enough bill were able to eat the food left, out, uh, left over after the drought. But still, the variance within that population is still around 82% due to additive genetic effects. So if the environment had no effect on the finch population, then heritability would be one, right? It's only dependent on the 
environment. It's only dependent on the genes that they get from the parents. So that means that if um, that means that larger beaked, larger build parents will always give, um, always have larger build offspring, right? If heritability were one, you get a nice um, slope of one, R equals one, whatever the mid parents were, that's what the offspring, the offspring was. And then on this graph, right? What a H2 of one means that no matter what the parents were, that's what the offspring were. If the offspring of the parents had small bills, the offspring had small bills. If the, if the parents had large bills, the offspring had large bills. So this is a heritability of one, right? This is very important to be acquainted with these charts. Make sure you understand what this is saying. If there is no genetic contribution to bill size, right? Then heritability would be zero. If it was only environmental, that means you would see a scatter plot that has no correlation, right? There's no relationship between the mid parent build depth and the offspring build depth. So you can have a parent with a large beak having offspring with small beaks or vice versa, because it's all random or it's all due to environmental effects. Right. So you have to just, um, make sure you understand what these graphs mean and how to look at the scatter plot to figure out the relative heritability of a trait. So genetic relatedness is the average fraction of common alleles at all genetic loci shared by relatives. So in other words, right, it's a way of saying how much genes do you share with your relatives? You share 50% of your genes with your parents, right? You got half from mom, half from dad. So on average, half of the genes you got are from mom, half are from dad. With that said, you share 25% of the genes with your grandparents, your aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews. So if there are two generations, you're one generation away from your parents, so the way you figure that out, you can look at one over two. So let me just draw this actually. One over two to the N um, gives you the percentage of genetic relations that you have of genetic, that's supposed to be GR. So for example, since I'm one generation away from my parents, I share one over two to the one or one half of my genes. My aunt is two links away, right? It's my mom and then my mom's sister. So then the end would be two. So I share one over four or one quarter of my genes with my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, nieces, and nephews, anybody that's um, two branch points apart. For my great, or they could say my first cousin, right, your first cousin would share is that's three links away from you, right? Because then you have first your mom, then your aunt, and then your aunt's child, for example, that's a first cousin. So then you're three links away. So you'd be one over two to the three or one eighth or 12.5% genetically similar to your first cousins. And in order to study heritability in humans, it's very helpful to study twins. So let's take a refresher on two types of twins. Monozygotic twins or MZ twins occur when a single ovulated egg is fertilized by one sperm. That embryo then splits into two. And in monozygotic twins, you have 100% of the alleles shared. They're clones of each other. In dizygotic twins, you have two ovulated eggs fertilized by two different sperm. These twins are no more identical than any two brothers or brother and sister even. So these twins have 50% of the alleles shared. Since 
monozygotic twins are genetically identical, we can use monozygotic twins as a way to measure broad sense heritability, so big H squared, because any variation in the phenotype must be due to the environment. They have the same additive effects, same dominance effects, same interactive effects. So with monozygotic twins that have a genetic relatedness of 1.0, they're 100% identical. So this is a way we can estimate um, broad sense heritability. And the best way to do this is to study identical twins that were separated at birth. So think about why this makes the most sense. We have identical twins. They're identically similar. They're genetically identical. But if they're separated at birth, that means they're raised in different environments. So 10 years later, you can then study their phenotypes and see if there are any differences. And if there are differences in phenotype, you know those can't be due to genetics alone because they have the same exact genes. So we can plot the trait values of one adopted twin against the other co-twin. So let's say we want to measure IQ. We want to say, is IQ heritable? So I'll take pairs of identical twins that were separated at birth. They never met each other. They're in different environments. So let's say when one IQ is 100 for one twin, the other twin had 100. And when one had 120, the other twin was 120. And one had 150, the other one was 150. Again, this is an example. That means the line of correlation would be close to one. There's a very high correlation between the trait value of one adopted twin with the co-twin. So this slope can give us an estimate of big H squared, a broad sense heritability. The only way to get broad sense heritability is by studying monozygotic twins separated at birth. This is hard, right? You don't have many monozygotic twins separated at birth to study. There are in fact databases available of twins that are separated at birth. So a geneticist can survey these people. There are ways to get access to them, but it's a lot harder to study monozygotic twins. Um, and it's harder, it's, it's an ethical issue by separating twins at birth just for an experiment. So in the ideal case, we can use monozygotic twins raised apart to find the slope that represents H squared. So take a second to answer this question. Height was measured in monozygotic twins that were separated at birth. What is the broad sense heritability for height? And here I give you that the, the slope is 0.8. So you measured monozygotic twins height, plotted them on a scatter plot and found the slope. So if the slope is 0.8. That means that the broad sense heritability is 0.8. So the answer is C. So, like I mentioned, very few pairs of monozygotic twins have been raised apart. So the studies are pretty difficult um, to do, but we can use monozygotic twins in a separate way to estimate heritability by comparing their phenotypic differences with those of dizygotic twins. So this is important. So to determine the relative contributions of genes, to a continuous trait, meaning one that is like numerical, we want to compare the slopes of correlation lines for monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. So I'll say this one more time. What we can do is we can compare the heritability, we could, we could compare the relative contributions of genes to monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. And the greater the difference in slopes on the scatter plot, the greater the heritability. Right, so let me explain this. Since dizygotic twins only share 50% of their loci and monozygotic twins share 100% of their loci, you're always gonna get a higher slope for monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins. So what you can do with this is you can compare the trait values for different pairs of monozygotic twins whose genetic relatedness is 
with the trait values for different pairs of dizygotic twins, whose genetic relatedness is 0.5. And by comparing these two slopes, we can um, figure out the relative contributions of genes and the environment. So we're just comparing the R MZ, so the slope of correlation for the monozygotic twins, to the RDZ, the correlation of dizygotic twins. And RMZ will always be greater than RDZ because the MZ twins have twice as many genes, right? Because MZ twins share the same genes and the environment, where DZ genes, uh, the dizygotic twins only share the same environment and half the genes. So DZ twins have a genetic relatedness of 0.5. And we're going to assume that monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins both experience the same variations in the environment. So we can put this into an equation to estimate um, heritability. To estimate heritability, we take RMZ, so the slope of this line, minus RDZ, the slope of this line, and we multiply that by 2. And we have to multiply this by two because dizygotic twins only share half of their genes. Um, without getting too complicated, if we compared this monozygotic twins with, let's say, grandparents and grandsons correlation, the genetic role, this is confusing, so I hope this doesn't um, make it worse. If we're comparing, let's say, people, so grandparents and grandsons only have 0.25% genetic relatedness. So if we do that comparison and we subtract those slopes, we would have to multiply that by four instead of two. So what we're basically doing is we're dividing. So another way to look at this, if I did, you could do RMZ, RMZ minus RDZ. So take those two slopes and you divide it by the genetic relatedness. So in this case, the difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins is 0.5. So we divide it by 0.5, which is the same thing as saying it's two times this. So since we're comparing monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, and there's a difference of 0.5 genetic relatedness, we have to divide this by 0.5. If we were comparing MZ twins with somebody who had a genetic relatedness of 0.25, we would divide this by 0.25. You wouldn't see that though. I'm just trying to explain how we get the, the math behind this equation. So we can use these kinds of studies to estimate the heritability of a lot of different quantitative traits, right? So the greater the differences in slopes, the greater the heritability. And again, another way to think about this in equational terms is we're figuring out what is the different, how much of these differences are due to genes alone. So since monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins have similar environments, we're saying the, any differences we see in the correlation is due to VG, variance in genetic differences. And since Monozygotic twins have twice as many common genes than dizygotic twins. We multiply that by two. So you should memorize this equation. When comparing dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins, heritability equals two times RMZ minus RDZ. So correlation of IQ was measured between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. The slope for monozygotic twins is 0.6. For dizygotic, it's 0.2. What is the heritability of IQ in that population? And I want you to think about what this means. Right? What does it mean that 0.6, that there's a correlation of 0.6? What does it mean that there's a correlation of 0.2? Right, so if there is a huge, does this mean that IQ is heritable? Yes or no? You would say yes, right? There's three times the correlation in IQ between twins that have the same genes that between twins that have half the same genes.
So we could take 0.6 minus 0.4, oh, sorry, minus 0.2, which is 0.4, and we multiply that by 2 to get D.8. So in this population, IQ um, has a heritability of 0.8. So it is very genetically um, impacted. So these are some values of heritability um, that were estimated in different populations um, at a particular time. So height can go anywhere from 0.68 to 0.9 heritability. Birth weight between 0.64 and 0.84. So there's a lot of um, ranges, right? There's a lot of diversity in what you can get because each heritability value um, is in a specific population at a specific time, right? So that was how we found the um, heritability for complex traits that are quantitative, that are numerical. When we have to plot um, IQ or height, those are plotting numbers against numbers. But what if a trait is discrete? Meaning it's still a complex trait. It's controlled by many factors, but there's only a yes or a no answer. There's only two possible phenotypes. So if you're talking about cancer incidence, you can't have a 0.4 cancer, right? It's either have cancer or you don't. If you're talking about alcoholism, you're either an alcoholic or you're not. If you get heart attack, you either have a heart attack or you don't. These are discrete traits. It's a yes or no, a one or the other. Compare that to um, quantitative traits that are numerical. So we can't plot discrete traits in the same way, right? We can't just plot yeses and nos. But we can still use twin studies to study um, discrete traits by comparing the concordance, the concordance. So we can compare the concordance between monozygotic twin pairs and dizygotic twin pairs. And the concordance is the frequency with which both twins share the same trait. So if when one twin has blue eyes, 80% of the time the other twin has blue eyes, then there's an 80% concordance of the blue-eyed phenotype in twins. Right? If when one twin is five foot tall, the other twin is five foot tall 100% of the time, that means the concordance is 100%. Right? If the concordance is 10%, that means only 10% of the twins with a trait have a twin that shares that trait. Right, so concordance for cancer incidence is 60% for monozygotic twins. Then 60% of my my monozygotic twin pairs will both get cancer. 40% of those, only one will get cancer and not the other. So by comparing the concordance between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, we can estimate the relative heritability of the trait. And we also want to look at unrelated children who were adopted in the same family. And that will become um, a little more obvious in just a bit. So let's take an example of the, a trait in which differences in phenotype are solely due to the environment. So again, you have a trait that is not heritable at all. The heritability is zero. So over here, Let's just take, let's say it's a, a common trait. Let's start over here. Whether you're a monozygotic twins, you share 100% of your genes, 50% of your genes, or 0% of your genes, you still have the same trait because it's 0% heritability. Regardless of the amount of genes you share, the concordance is the same on average because right, it's only due to the environment. So whether it's a very common trait you're still going to see, let's say, 80% concordance between two unrelated individuals, dizygotic twins or monozygotic twins. there will be the same concordance, right? Same concordance, same concordance, because the heritability is zero. Compare that um, if you have a heritability of 
So if there is a very large um, genetic contribution to differences, you're going to see a big shift in uh, concordance values. So you would see if heritability is one in monozygotic twins, 100% of the time, when one twin has the trait, the other one will have the trait. 100% of the time. For dizygotic twins, those have half the genes. Um, they share half the genes of each other. So you're going to have a high concordance, likely, if the heritability is 1.0. But since they only share 50% of the genes, you're never going to get up to 100%. So in dizygotic twins, you're going to have um, a high concordance, likely, since you have a trait of 1.0 heritability, but it's not going to be 100%. Finally, if you compare unrelated to people who are just adopted in the same family, they share the same environment, but since they're unrelated, they share 0% roughly of their genes. So they're not going to have a high concordance at all. They're going to have the lowest concordance between the three, even though it's very heritable. Since they don't share a large percentage of genes, you're not going to have a high concordance. And depending on the commonality of the trait, you're going to see, right, if it's a very rare trait, it's going to be very unlikely for two unrelated people to both have it. If it's like a genetic disease, for example, the chances of two unrelated people having it is very unlikely. And you're going to see that DZ approaches 50%. If it's a very common trait, two unrelated individuals would likely have it anyway, like brown hair or something. So the extent of these differences varies with the commonality of the trait. The more common the trait, the more likely two unrelated people will have it. Right, we said the heritability is 1.0. The concordance of MZ twins will always be 100%. The concordance of DZ twins will always be higher than unrelated, but lower than monozygotic. So what is the approximate heritability for this common trait? So the answer is zero, right? Regardless of whether you share 100%, 50%, or 0% of your genes, you have the same exact concordance. So it's not heritable. So to measure heritability um, using concordance, we need to get our concordance values for both monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. And the higher the ratio of MZ concordance to DZ concordance, the higher the heritability. Right? Basically, the more likely that two identical twins share something compared to two non-identical twins sharing something, the more genetic the trait is. It's the same idea as comparing slopes in a scatter plot, but we can't make a slope if these traits are discrete, right? We can't plot cancer incidences and in yeses and nos. So we can't um, make a slope in a scatter plot, but we could compare the concordance, right? What is the ratio of twins that both have that trait? So for a discrete trait, for a discrete trait, you can measure heritability with this equation. MZ concordance minus DZ concordance over one minus DZ concordance. That is your um, way to figure out heritability for discrete traits. And I'm gonna try to explain it a little bit, uh, but this takes into account two things. Right, this is another way of just explaining VG over VP. Right, what proportion of genetic variance is, uh, or what proportion of the variance is due to just genetic differences compared to all the different variants in the population? Um, I'm going to try my best to explain this uh, calculation, um, but it's a little tricky. So what this is saying is MZ concordance minus DZ concordance. The closer these two values are, the lower the numerator will be and the lower the heritability will be. What that means is you want to see a big difference between monozygotic twin concordance and DZ concordance to see a high heritability value. 
So the larger the difference between MZ and DZ concordance, the higher the heritability value. The denominator takes into account how common the trait is in the population. So you basically take one minus the DZ concordance. So it's saying how many people are different? How many twins do not share that trait, right? One minus DZ concordance. So the closer to one the denominator is, the less heritable it's going to be. So the lower the DZ concordance, the more her um, the less heritable it's going to be. So we're looking at your genetic variation over your total variation um, combined. So the lower the denominator, the lower the total variation, the higher the heritability. So this equation is something you should be familiar with and try your best to understand um, what it's saying. So what is the heritability for Parkinson's disease? So take a second to figure this out. So for Parkinson's disease, we have to look at this table and we see the concordance between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. So what this means is 16% of all the monozygotic twins surveyed both have Parkinson's. But 84% of them, when one has Parkinson's, the other does not. So just from thinking about that, do you think heritability or do you think Parkinson's disease is very heritable or no? It's not seeming very heritable already. If 84%, uh, when one has it, the other does not have it. And let's compare that to dizygotic twins. That has 0.11. So 11% of dizygotic twins both have um, Parkinson's, but 89% do not. So what does that value tell us? So how do we plug this in? We have to take heritability equals MZ concordance minus DZ concordance over one minus DZ. So it's 0.16 minus 0.11 over one minus 0.11. So what we have to figure out now is just the heritability and that should be pause here. The answer should be C. So it's not very heritable at all, 0.056. So most, uh, so Jeanette, uh, Parkinson's is mostly affected by the environment and other random factors, not genes. What about type one diabetes? So now, we see 43% of monozygotic twins both have type 1 diabetes. Compare that to 0.074 for dizygotic twins. What this means is that it's a very, very high concordance between monozygotic twins compared to DZ twins. But still, when dizygotic twins share half of their genes, Right, it's still very uncommon to get um, two dizygotic twins with type 1 diabetes. So there's a large environmental factor as well, right? Not only a um, genetic factor, but it's definitely you would expect a higher heritability for type 1 diabetes than Parkinson's disease. So if you plug these values in, you should get B. 0.38. Finally, what about autism? So autism spectrum disorder, 94% concordance in MZ twins compared to 0.47% in dizygotic twins. And again, this seems very heritable off the charts, right? So the highest that this can be is 1.0, very close. The highest that this can be is 0.5 very close. And doing the math, you would see that the answer is D, 0.89. So autism spectrum disorders are highly heritable in the population that was studied here.
So for a good overview, you could watch this link. This talks about uh, some of the equations we spoke about and goes into a little more depth um, as to why these equations make sense. So here is a cheat sheet to measure heritability comparing progeny and parents. We said that H2 um, narrow sense heritability can be estimated by the correlation coefficient through a scatter plot of the trait values between the mid parent and their progeny. Right, the more closely the offspring resembles their parents, the closer the slope will be to one, and the more heritable that trait is. To compare MZ and DZ twins for quantitative complex traits, you do a scatter plot and you use the equation 2 times RMZ minus RDZ. And that tells us that the greater the difference between the slopes of the data for MZ and DZ twins, the greater the heritability. For discrete complex traits, like a yes or no answer, you have to use concordance. And the equation is MZ concordance minus DZ concordance divided by 1 minus DZ concordance. And here, the heritability not only depends on the magnitude of difference between MZ concordance and DZ concordance, but also on the magnitude of DZ concordance in the denominator. So the last part of uh, the chapter or the section uh, talks about how a trait's heritability can determine its potential for evolution. So a trait with high heritability has a lot of potential to evolve by either natural selection or artificial selection. So suppose a farmer is farming beans and bean size is very highly heritable, very reliant on genes. You can, the farmer can then select the largest beans and plant them and hope that they will produce even larger beans than the average. This is the idea of in height, right? We said if we have tall parents, they should have children that are taller than average since height is very heritable. If the trait isn't based on genetics, you'd have to alter the environment to change those traits. So if let's say bean size was not very heritable, it wouldn't pay for the farmer to select the larger beans and, and plant them. It would pay for the farmer to investigate the best environment to grow the biggest beans. So let's use this example. A farmer wants to select for large edible beans. So he started off with a normal distribution of bean sizes in the parental generation. And here's the mean of the uh, original parent beans. And he selected a group of larger beans from the parents. So this is what he selected is all in orange. He selected this group of the larger, right, the above average beans, and he planted them. The selection differential, S, is the difference between the bean weight of the parents, so that's this value over here, and the average bean weight of the entire, sorry, I'm going to say that one more time. The selection differential is the difference between the bean weight of the selected parents, which is here. Right, those are the, the larger parents that were selected to be planted. So that's this, the selected parents, minus the average bean weight and the initial population. So what S is saying, how much larger were the beans you selected than the average beans in your field? That's the selection differential. So S is measured as the distance between here, the mean of the selected group, and the population mean. That's S. We then have what's called the response to selection, or R. So once I take these larger beans, these parents, and I plant them, I want to see how much they change. How much larger is the average progeny and the offspring compared to the average parents in the previous generation. Basically saying how much of a response that I see by selecting these larger beans and growing them. So R is the difference between the mean progeny, so the larger beans average, subtracted by the previous generation's average bean size. So that's R, the response to selection. And we can use R and S to approximate the narrow sense heritability of bean size inheritance.
So by dividing R, so R divided by S will give you the narrow sense heritability, right? So basically it's saying is how much of a response do you get based on what you selected? And the larger the response you get, the more heritable that trait must be. And knowing the selection differential, so you can figure out, so like a farmer can say, hmm, if I take these size beans and plant them, I already know the heritability of height that's been figured out. So I can decide, right, how much change I'm gonna expect to see in the next generation. Or vice versa, you can, if a farmer says, I want beans of X weight, Using this formula, you can, he can know the size of beans to plant. And then knowing the response to selection, he can predict right what he's going to get in the next generation. So let's use an example. So a plant breeder is interested in selecting for larger sized edible beans. These are the parent generations. So it's like a histogram of the number of bean seeds at all these different weights. And this looks roughly like a normal distribution. Beans from the upper range of the distribution, so this group that were above 650 milligrams, were selected and they were planted. And the distribution sizes among progeny are shown in purple at the bottom of the figure. So the number above the distributions indicate the mean weights of the beans at the parental generation. So the average in the parent generation was 403 milligrams. The average of the progeny was 609 milligrams. So for this experiment, what is S? What is the selection differential? So for this, you have to take the um, selected group, right? Minus the average of the group. So the selection differential for this case is 691.7 minus 403.5, which would give you 288.2 milligrams. What is the response to selection in this experiment? Right, response is, again, the difference between the new average weight and the previous average weight. So the response to selection would be 609 minus 403, or about 205 milligrams. Calculate the heritability for bean weight based on this data. So H squared is R over S, so it's 205 divided by 288, which would give you a heritability of about 0.71. And is this narrow sense or broad sense heritability? The answer is it's narrow sense. We're comparing parents with their offspring and the offspring don't share 100% of the genes as their parents. They only share half. So it doesn't take into account epistasis or dominance, only the additive effects of the alleles. And finally, how successful was the breeder in applying artificial selection, right? Can he have um, improved the experiment to obtain even larger beans in the same growing period? So to answer that question, you can say he was absolutely successful, right? He was able to increase his bean size quite a bit, right? The response to selection was um, 205 milligrams on average. That's a huge increase in, um, in bean size for him. And he could have um, picked even heavier beans, even beans that weighed even more um, to get even larger beans in the same growing period. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about GWAS, which stands for Genome Wide Association Studies. And I only have a few slides on this. Um, I'd like you to watch this video first. Um, that gives you an overview of what GWAS actually is and what it does and why we care. Uh, so that's a good starting point. Um, basically what GWAS is doing, right? We're looking at genomes and we're trying to make associations. So what we do is we look at complete genomes of many, 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 many people. And we see if there's a correlation between a specific mutation, like a specific SNP and a phenotype, usually a disease. 
So what we're doing is we're rapidly scanning mar markers across the complete genomes of many, many people to find any genetic variations that are associated with a particular disease. So you might have two groups of people, you might have a large group of people with a specific disease, and then you might have a very large people of uh, controls that do not have the disease. You then sequence their entire genomes as best you can. You look for specific SNPs. And let's say you see a lot more of the cases have one particular single nucleotide polymorphism, that one specific mutation that is not found in the controls. You can plot the specific mutations that are found at a lot higher frequency in the cases than in the controls to figure out that perhaps one a SNP, one of these mutations, is associated with the disease. So this is a way to figure out if there are any um, SNPs that are associated with a particular disease. And this is again done by just comparing the frequencies of different SNPs or different other um, genomic markers. So let's say you have a large group of people with a disease and you have a large group of people without the disease. You want to look at each individual SNP. So let's say in one SNP, one single nucleotide polymorphism, you could either have GG or GC. And it happens to be a C 55% of the time in the people with the disease. Without the disease, they only have a C 47% of the time, right? They, know they have a G most of the time. So if you were to compare, so 55% of the people with the disease have a C, where only 47% of the people without the disease have a C, by using a variation of the chi-square equation, you could calculate a p-value. What is the likelihood that this deviation is significant? Right? Is the 55% that much different than the 47%? And this p-value is very, very, very small. And that means, yes, this is a very st uh, statistically significant deviation. So there must be something about this C and this SNP that might predict um, the uh, prevalence of this disease. So the chi-square test is used to show um, a significant difference between the control and the disease groups. And you would have to repeat this for many, many SNPs. So a lot of times you can use a microarray that has a lot of different SNPs um, on there already. It will pick up a lot of SNPs at once. And if you use like uh, thousands and thousands of people with the disease compared to thousands and thousands of people without the disease, you might see that certain SNPs are more common in the disease group. And that must mean that that SNP is associated with the disease. So significant associations have a very small chance of being observed just by chance alone. So that's why that's the, a small p-value um, means that it's a very significant link between the SNP and the disease. Um, so what you could do is make a Manhattan plot, which each of these dots represents a different SNP that was sequenced along all 23 chromosomes. And it just so happens, um, in this example, they were looking for people, um, they were looking for an association with coronary artery disease. So they took a large group of people with um, heart disease and a lot of people who did not have heart disease. And they saw that there is a region on chromosome nine that kept on being prevalent only in those with heart disease and not those without heart disease. So since and again, this is plotting the negative log of the p-value. So only a value of only a very, very statistical, statistically significant association will give you a peak. Right. So since it was 10 to the negative 14 chance of, of having this association by chance, you can see a very large peak over here. This means that the correlation of having a SNP on chromosome nine and heart disease is a very tight association. They're very statistically linked. So therefore, if you have one of these SNPs on chromosome nine, you might have a chance of getting heart disease. And we have published GWAS studies for 17 different traits. 
Um, a lot of them have to do with digestive diseases and cardiovascular diseases, but these are showing all the chromosomes and each of these dots represents a SNP that's associated with one of these diseases. So these GWAS studies require very large data sets, very large groups of people. And you can then figure out uh, if there's an association between a SNP and a disease. So in theory, in the future, you can do your sequencing. You can sequence all of your DNA and figure out if you have a likelihood of getting a certain disease or not. That's very much of what like 23andMe does. They look for certain SNPs that are associated with a particular disease. And believe it or not, this is the end. So that's the end of chapter 22. Um, hopefully this um, makes sense so far. This is a little bit of the trickier stuff, um, but I think you'll all have enough resources uh, between the book and the slides to understand it all. So for the next exam, that will cover chapter 21 and chapter 22. So make sure you watch this um, several times to make sure you understand the math as well as the concepts.